Good afternoon, Mr. Elkhir, Ahlan wa Sahlan. We are very happy to welcome um, uh, you at the CEFDAS uh, first uh, lecture organized with the support of uh, IFAO. Um, this event is the first in a cycle of conferences dedicated to archaeology uh, and history of Sudan and Nubia. Uh, we are pleased to welcome today our colleague Elsa, Elsa Ivanez, who has just arrived from uh, Denmark. Elsa is an uh, associate professor uh, of archaeology at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, she works at the Saxo Institute, uh, a center for textile research. Um, she's a specialist of the, uh, in the production and use of textiles in ancient uh, Sudan and Nubia. And uh, she's leading a five-year uh, research project, ERC uh, starting grant, Fashioning Sudan, Archaeology of Dress Practices Along the Middle Nile. Um, Elsa will talk about the different sensory dimensions of textile and skin garments based on material dated from the A group to the medieval period. Elsa, je t'en prie, bienvenue. Merci. Uh, thank you so much, Severin, for the introduction. Thank you to every one of you who uh, have chosen to spend a little bit of time with me today. Um, First of all, I would like to start by saying that I'm extremely happy, honored, uh, you could say, to have been invited to open this uh, cycle of conferences. I hope to be able uh, to be a little bit you know, of a, a useful piece in these new times for the CEFDAS uh, here uh, in Cairo. For sure, we are a little bit far from Khartoum, um, but we are here, we are active, so thank you so much for welcoming me. Thank you to the IFAO as well for hosting the talk. And uh, thank you uh, for my very dear colleagues from the ENCAN uh, who are here today with us as well. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, today this talk about, is about the sensory archaeology of garments, and hopefully I will try to show you how we can use the senses to bring a new approach to the uh, archaeology of the body in ancient Sudan and Nubia. But uh, because this is my first talk, it's my first time here at DFO, uh, so I thought I should maybe start uh, by presenting myself a little bit. First, to be polite uh, in a way, but also to frame the rest uh, of the talk. As you would see in many ways, uh, my ideas about ancient um, garments and the archaeology of textiles in general have been shaped by my academic profile. Uh, so I figured it was going to yeah, make sense to uh, present myself a little bit. So I am French, originally, <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, I studied in Egyptology uh, in Paris, and then quite quickly uh, I moved to London, uh, where I started working with textile research at UCL. Uh, after that, I started my PhD research uh, with a one-year stay at the CEFDAS, so it's a long love affair between me and the CEFDAS, you could say, uh, in the Sudan National Museum, and that's at this stage that I started working on the archaeology of textile production, specifically focusing on the Meritic period, which is this um, time in late antiquity roughly dated to 350 BCE to 350 CE. Um, after that, uh, I did a postdoc uh, project, a Marie Curie a European project in the Center for Textile Research in Copenhagen. That's really when I started delving more uh, into textile production and textile research as a field. Um, so very much you could say that I started uh, working on the material culture of the Nile Valley in Egyptology, very much uh, so from the beginnings, uh, but now more and more involved with um, the field of textile research. My last project was very much on burial archaeology and the use of textiles across the funerary uh, practices. And um, yeah, finally now, I sort of rejoined uh, the city here where I am uh, teaching as well. So I am involved in the field uh, in several, with several missions, uh, some Spanish missions in, in Egypt, but also in Sudan when it was possible to, uh, to go. Um, the current mission, the last uh, mission I have done in Sudan was in Sai Island and quite a lot of the material that I will show you today is originating from this site. So I will show you. We are here in Sai Island in middle Nubia. Um, otherwise, a lot of the material that I'm going to be using today as examples are coming from the site of Jebelada, which is uh, well, today under the water of the Lac uh, Nasser in Egyptian Nubia. And also um, material from the Scandinavian Joint Expedition, uh, 
concession area uh, located also in lower Nubia. Uh, because of this, that a lot of the material comes from funerary archaeology uh, in Nubia, part of this has been um, now is now in a European or American uh, museum as well as in uh, Sudan, of course. So I uh, have several ongoing collaborations with different museums. Uh, at the moment, we're working very much at the British Museum as well as in Uppsala in the Gustavianum uh, Museum, and I also have another uh, project with the National. Uh, Museum of Denmark. Um, I was very lucky to go to Sudan several times to the National uh, Sudan Museum in Khartoum where I was uh, able to document quite a lot of the tools uh, for textile production that they are curating there, uh, as well as some of the textiles from different periods. So all in all, you can say that my research focuses on different themes, uh, but I try to be as holistic uh, in my approach as possible. Because what I'm truly interested in uh, is what we can learn uh, from textiles uh, about the past societies who lived uh, along the Nile. So I work with textiles, but also with tools, iconography, very little with texts, uh, because we do not have much uh, relevant textual sources for this, uh, this period about craft production in general. I mainly explore the themes, um, themes around the ecology of production, so including landscape, animal and plant species that are used uh, to produce garments. But I also work with themes around technology and the organization of production, also the exchange of knowledge, raw material and textile products along the Nile. And uh, my current project, the Fashioning Sudan Archaeology of Dress along the Middle Nile project, is very much about dress practices. I will talk to you a little bit more about this. Uh, and the other one that I've just started, it's called Lives of a Mummy, a Biographies of an Ancient Egyptian Woman, uh, in which we're going to document the whole wardrobe uh, of more than 20 tunics that were found around a 25th to 26th dynasty um, temple singer from Thebes uh, that is now in the National Museum of uh, Denmark. So that project is sort of like merging dress practices and textiles in funerary uh, practices. So why textiles, you may ask? Um, well, I could have focused on many different things, but somehow I stumbled on this uh, subject quite early on. There are many reasons uh, for it, I guess. Um, some that sound very scientific, and I could list them for sure. Uh, very serious ones, uh, but also that is probably closer to the truth. Um, I should say that I like textiles, I guess, because I find them quite intimate uh, in a way, especially when they are garments. They are everywhere. Uh, if you look around you today, uh, you can see many uh, textiles in our living environment, on ourselves, of course, first of all. And they define so much of who we are, uh, of what we wish to portray about ourselves, uh, but also at the same time, they are very, very close to our skin. Um, you could say that as soon as we arrive in the world, we are wrapped uh, in textiles, and if we are lucky, uh, our community will also wrap our body when we die. So in a certain way, uh, textiles seem like a very intimate way to reach past people, to almost touch their daily life and uh, realities. And you can see here a textile imprint on skin. Um, that is, I suppose, why I like them so much. You can almost snoop in uh, ancient life, it seems. So, of course, textiles and garments are not just about individual people and individual choices. Uh, they are also very much part of a social cultural discourse. If we take the very sort of um, striking case of uniforms, for example, it is easy to say that the way we dress engage in a dialogue with the outside world. It is utterly social. Because the way you dress reflects a lot of who you are and of who you would like others to think you are. And it works in the present, as you can see here in uh, different religious um, uniform, uh, you could say, priestly garments. But it also look, works in the past. Uh, here you have an example of a very iconic uh, figure of an Egyptian priest um, wearing this archetypical leopard skin, which we know uh, would have been on occasion copied in textile form. So this is the basic premise of the Fashioning Sudan project, 
to use archaeological remains of garments made primarily of textiles and animal skin to better understand elements of people's identities. So as uh, Severin mentioned, it is an ERC starting grant project uh, that has been founded by the European Union for five years, and it's hosted at the University of Copenhagen in collaboration with the CEFDAS and the NCAN. The idea of the project was very much born uh, during a collaborative study of a triangular loincloth, which you can see here, illustrated um, now of the remains and how it was found on the remains inside again. Um, that was found in an early medieval tomb uh, on Sai Island. Um, and the project, together with the excavation director, Vincent Francini, and the team of the American Museum of Natural History, um, was to conduct a multi-proxy analysis of this garment that shed light on a lot of different research questions. Uh, what I found fascinating in this uh, particular case uh, was the study that was the study of one item only uh, could bring information about very large-scale issues. Um, by looking at the fiber, you can access information about the agricultural or pastoral practices, um, but also on very tiny scale, um, on the scale of the individual, when we start looking at how the garment was used in life, uh, for example, it has a lot of repairs uh, in specific areas, but also, of course, how it was used in death in the gra in a grave. So this approach as a sort of theoretical framework has been quite well developed in textile archaeology in the past two decades or so under the wide theoretical framework that we called cloth cultures. Uh, but it has not really been uh, applied to archaeological textiles from Egypt and Sudan, uh, which is a bit of a pity considering we have so much material preserved uh, in the Nile Valley. So that was the goal of this project and other ones as well now uh, that are focusing on different types of archaeological uh, textile found in Egypt and Sudan. So before going any further, I need to take a few seconds to explain a few terms. I promise I will not bore you too much with heavy textile terminology. Uh, and if I do, you can just tell me stop right now. Uh, but just a few terms of what I will be sort of like shuffling around uh, this afternoon. Uh, so you have already heard me uh, use several times cloth, clothing, maybe also costume and dress. Uh, so basically, when we talk about cloth, we talk about um, the material. So we are talking about raw fibers, and we are talking about the way the material is formed, it's made. When we talk about clothing, we talk about an individual item, so a garment, and that can be uh, different things, of course. And when we talk about dress or costume, I prefer to use the word dress, uh, several reasons. We're going to talk about the assemblage of these garments on the body and in the case, um, well, many cultures, it can also include um, all kinds of body transformation uh, techniques such as tattoos, scarification, makeup, hairdos, and of course jewelry and every other personal accessories. Also, I should say that this presentation is going to contain images of human remains skeletonized or naturally mummified. Not too many, but some. Um, so, now, to dwell a little bit further into the Fashioning Sudan project, as uh, Severin has asked me to uh, briefly present it, I should explain that the goal of the project is to examine dress practices as a multifaceted phenomenon, to learn more about the resources, the ecology of garment production, the garments themselves, the economy of their production, um, as well as, of course, the society were produced, used, and reused them. So in the past, as well as in the present, uh, the study of dress has often uh, lived in the confines of iconographic representations. And for Sudanese practices, that has often mean using images that were produced by other people outside of Sudan and Nubia, often laded with quite a lot of political and colonial agendas. And that can be Egyptian pharaonic view of Nubian population as well as much more modern uh, images. So in our case, in our project, uh, we are anchoring the project in a very wide uh, data collection phase that includes artifacts and images that were produced and used in Sudan exclusively. 
We are working on building categories and terminologies and all that good stuff <laughs> in order to make sense of this specific context and hopefully closer to the past realities. Another large area of focus is the ecology of garment. I have been using this expression before. Um, and basically that looks into the plants and the animal species that were used uh, to make garments, how they were processed and how this work impacted uh, on the daily activities and the environment. Um, it's also very interesting to see how different populations at different times manipulated these resources so they answered different needs. And while doing so, shifted the economic focus. Uh, for example, when they started incorporating new crops, such as cotton, or engineering domestic animal species, such as sheep, so they start producing more wool. Uh, here we are looking into economic questions, uh, which are by no means new, uh, but we are looking at them through the prism of comfort, I guess you could say, not subsistence, so not what people uh, produce to eat, uh, but very much to wrap themselves in comfort, you could say. So in the case of sheep, for example, we are not looking at butchering practices for meat consumption, uh, but we are looking at the so-called secondary product, that is wool. Finally, the last aspect of the project is to develop case studies of uh, quite well-preserved clothing assemblages or types of garments, and to see what they can tell us about the identities of the person wearing them. So we are interested in questions of age, social status, gender, rank, occupation, etc. cetera. Uh, this part is where the theoretical reflection about the body uh, in the past uh, is really going to meet the archaeology of dress practices. And it will be interesting to see how garments were at the interface between the body and the set of crucial life experiences. I will develop that um, later, of course. So to explore these different themes, the project is quite wide in its chronological coverage. Uh, we are incorporating material from a very long period. Now going all the way back to the A group, that was not planned. We stumbled upon material that we didn't know existed. So we have extended towards an uh, earlier period, all the way to the um, early medieval. Um, we have holes here and there, depending on the, the preservation of the material. Um, especially for the Napaton period. If any of you know material relevant for the Napaton period, I'm a taker. Um, and usually you could say that the more uh, you advance in time, the more available uh, preserved material there is. Uh, so far at the moment, our list of sites is counting 79 different locations, uh, provenance for garments, both animal skin and textile, uh, but the number is still growing. Obviously, I'm not doing this alone. Uh, this is the team as um, it is standing now. Uh, we have three different uh, postdocs, um, one research assistant slash graphic designer. We have a master's student, um, a two different guest researcher, including a weaver. Uh, we also have people that are specialized in database and uh, illustrations. Um, and as the research has been uh, progressing now for almost two years, uh, the place of the body and its relation to clothing is becoming more and more important in our thinking and in our interpretation. And this is how the idea of this talk first came about. Uh, it was very much dictated by our source material, as well as inspired by readings and discussions with a lot of different colleagues. Um, it is very much a work in progress. Uh, you could say that this line of inquiries has been and will continue to develop during the project. So I ask for your indulgence about half answers and vagaries, um, if there will be any. I will try to fully reference everything if you're interested in uh, finding source publications and so on. Uh, and I'm very much um, open to your own suggestions. So, to jump properly into the topic of the day, the sensory archaeology of garments. Uh, because it's a bit new in the archaeology of the Nile Valley, um, and because we are at this stage very much working on developing the method uh, to apply it in the Sudanese material, uh, I thought it might be useful to start by giving a little bit of a theoretical frame uh, to the question of body and the senses. I will try my best not to be too abscond. I am fully conscious that we are after lunch. For both of us, uh, we are not uh, doing um, 
in Ramadan. But uh, yeah, please try not to fall asleep right away. Uh, hopefully it will make sense for the second part of the talk uh, where I will be applying this frame to the ancient Sudanese material. So yes, um, I need to add, I suppose, that I will mainly focus on Meroitic textiles uh, because we do not have hours at our disposal and also because that is where most of my data set resides. Uh, but still, it will be important to note that the same approach can very much uh, be carried out with garments made of animal skin, textiles at any point of history, really. Um, yeah, so I, I did a few other examples here and there. So first of all, theoretical framing uh, for the body and the senses in Sudan and Nubia. So, um, I mentioned a little bit earlier our approach in the project, in the Fashioning Sudan project, uh, stems very much from the development of what is called the, the archaeology of the body, which has developed a lot uh, in the last three decades or so. I'm quoting here some of the foundational principles of this uh, paradigm as they are formulated uh, in this book uh, written by Emilakis, Pluchenik and Tarlow, Thinking Through the Body, Archaeology and Corporality. Um, this school of thought encourages us to place the body and its meaning at the center of our inquiries, recognizing its variable relationship to the self as a concept. So we can see the body as the location, the point of departure, uh, if you will, of different experiences and phenomenon which become visible and materialized, so-called embodied, on and around our body. So in that way, uh, it becomes entangled with the concept of materiality. The body is linked to material object, but it also becomes material culture as well. And because of this, uh, we always need to oscillate um, our reflection between the biological and cultural dimension of the body, recognizing that, of course, there is not a firm boundary between the two. Um, any concepts relative to the body are obviously far from universal. We share the same physical components, but our understanding of it takes many different forms through cultures and history. So when we work with the body and with senses, it is important to always question our modern biases, of course, as researchers. But in any case, uh, we like to consider the body as a project, as the locus, the location, of technologies of the self that are turning the body into a vehicle for self-exploration and identity expression, sorry. Could be self-exploration as well, I suppose. Um, such technologies can be very diverse. As I mentioned before, in ancient Sudan, we can mention jewelry, hairstyle, tattoos, and any other kind of uh, skin modification, and of course, clothing. So traditionally in Sudanese uh, archaeology, engagement with theory in general has not been necessarily uh, really high, and that's for a lot of different reasons. Uh, many researchers have, of course, focused on bioanthropological research, so material remains of the body, the human remains that are often very well preserved uh, in the many excavated cemeteries. But engagement with vertical debates remains fairly limited, uh, with several ex exceptions. You have some here uh, in the screen. Um, we can talk, of course, of the work of Michel Buzon and her team at Purdue University, who has been merging bioanthropology with more um, cultural um, interpretations. Uh, however, I, I guess in the past few years, uh, we have seen the multiplication of studies that are developing a theoretical reflection directly centered on the body or using core tenets of body archaeology to reinvigorate older historical questions. Um, we can quote the recent work that has been published by Van Pelt and a different project developed now currently by Renan Lemos at Cambridge um, on the cultural and material entanglements uh, that occurred during the Egyptian New Kingdom colonization of Nubia. Uro Shmatic is another scholar who is delving very much into these issues of the body in ancient Nubia, exploring uh, specifically themes around gender and age, um, quite often in the framework of, of conflict or power relations. The only, so far, all-encompassing uh, paper published on the topic of the body in general is the chapter that was uh, written in 2021 by Rachel uh, in the Oxford Handbook of Ancient Nubia, Perspectives um, on the Body in Ancient Nubia. 
um, in which she reviews quite a lot of different research themes and questions, but still most of the evidence is based on iconography, on the image of people, uh, which of course we know can be sometimes quite far from daily realities. So with textiles, I would argue that we can add a hopefully useful element to this area of research. Why? Because garments lay directly on top of the skin, uh, which is our largest organ and certainly one of our main instruments to feel the world around us. So garments tend to become a sort of second skin, an extension of the body, and as such, uh, they are placed at the interface between the body and the outside world, between the individual sphere uh, and the social sphere, uh, with whom we share cultural frameworks and, and attitudes. And you can redraw these figures in different, different ways uh, to understand this idea maybe in a more like bi-directional relations. We as human feel the garments on our body and in return the garments influence the way we sense the world. We can also uh, see it going inside out from our body, our core individuality to the outside world. Either way, uh, garments mediate our perception of the world and the world perception of ourselves. Which brings us to sensory archaeology. Uh, I have based most of my approach here in the fairly recent uh, Routledge Handbook of Sensory Archaeology, where there is a multitude of um, contributions that develop the basics of this approach and method, uh, including if you're interested, a paper on uh, sensory dimension in ancient Egypt. Um, and one on textiles. So the core idea of sensory archaeology uh, is to recognize life experiences as multi-sensorial. It is the idea that we experience the environment, the other people and things in the environment through our senses, and that these senses are shaped uh, by our cultural values. Um, in that way, it is uh, closely related to the concept of phenomenology and embodiment since senses will be used to bridge uh, the outside world and our body. So in broad terms, uh, sensory archaeology studies the sensory perspective and impacts of material things on people, as well as the sensory dimensions of culturally constructed landscapes. As a field of study, it rests on the distinction of several senses, the five senses listed um, historically by Aristotle, the sense of smell, hearing, hearing, sorry, sight, touch, and taste, as well as three or sometimes four additional senses. Uh, bear with me. There is proprioception, which is the sense of self-movement and body position. Vestibular sense, that's all about movement and balance. And there is also interoception, which is a sense of what is happening inside our own body. Uh, this is, of course, based on neurology. Uh, and some researchers in that field have actually extended this list to more than 33 different senses. But for today, I promise I will keep to those as a main template. So we can use these senses to build our sensorium. That is to say, the sum of our perceptions of the environment that surrounds us. As part of these perceptions, um, well, part of it is physical. We can assess it through our body and our brain. And another part is more cultural, uh, since our reactions to the environment are also conditioned by our culture. And in this way, we are reading signals from the environment and using them to interact with the world. We can also reverse, reverse this direction and ask about the sensory affordance of the environment. What is our surroundings giving us to feel? Um, for example, uh, we could ask about the sensory affordance of this room. Um, what is this room allowing us to feel? Uh, I suppose you can say it has very high ceilings, uh, for example. So we could feel the large space above. Uh, it is providing us with more space, with air, and a feeling of, I guess, physical freedom to breathe. We could like it finding it comfortable because we have more space, or we could dislike it. Maybe we're feeling too exposed or intimidated. I could also talk about the feelings that I have now, having you so far away from me and me all alone on this side of the room, <laughs> for example. So considering these questions when working with archaeological material uh, can bring us closer to the ancient people, closer to the lived experiences. But it has also, of course, many limitations. Uh, as I mentioned, the senses are conditioned by both physical and cultural phenomenon. 
and very difficult to grasp. Uh, there is also a high degree of intersubjectivity. How can we truly feel what the ancient people feel? Sometimes it can seem like wild guesswork, uh, you could argue. So what to do? Um, well, we first need to root all our uh, methods and our research in very solid material evidence so that we can build a method that can allow us to record precise parameters of an object's sensory affordance. It also helps tremendously if we have written sources uh, that at one point or the other recorded ancient events and feelings. So even if it can seem a little bit uh, like a theoretical exercise, I believe that it is quite useful, uh, nonetheless, as this type of approach helps to fight also our own prejudices. It is very much based on, on humans, and it considers the whole body in a holistic approach to human experiences. So we are trying to go from the inside out, from the, the material, from the people who used it, to uh, larger questions, instead of applying our own frame of references on objects. So in a context of um, ancient Egypt, sensory approaches has been developed by several scholars, um, specifically by Richard Parkinson, who has recognized the, but of course the huge um, potential of this line of research uh, in ancient Egypt, because we have so much surviving data, as well as a lot of texts and images. Um, for example, if we take the many representations or accounts of banquets, um, they give, I would argue, a particularly evocative image uh, of the sensory experiences that were offered by such uh, events. Um, the text, for example, here um, mention music, singing, dancing, and everything is a part uh, of this um, assemblage of experiences uh, during uh, the banquet. They are quite recurrent and they are very powerful uh, experiences in a way. Still, um, when we focus on pharaonic Egypt, um, and maybe because of the predominance of the iconography and textual sources, the sensory studies tend to be uh, quite limited to visual and textual aspects and de facto to elite spheres. Uh, we are missing a little bit more sort of artifactual and sensory approach, um, more like widely shared daily life experiences, one could argue. In Sudan, the uh, situation is uh, quite uh, different because we have much less iconographic representation and very few texts uh, that can bear evidence to such experiences. Scholars have adopted a slightly different approach. It is very much based on the surrounding environment, uh, for example, on the soundscape and visual scape um, that surrounded uh, people. We can quote here the, the work carried out by Cornelia Klenitz around the rock gongs in a fourth cataract, or about the, the graffiti um, as landscape markers that, were, um, very, that are very numerous in the fourth cataract region as well as in and around the great enclosure um, religious enclosure of Musawaha Tel Sufra. There is also the project uh, led by Neil Spencer uh, at Amara West um, that developed an all-encompassing survey of living experiences in this new kingdom to, uh, town that covers a little bit of everything, really, uh, living spaces, the use and the circulation uh, between space, daily life activities, environmental surroundings, uh, also, all kinds of information uh, gathered from the cemetery and the study of the human remains, such as life conditions, health and diseases, and the treatment of the dead. So all of this together uh, give quite precious information about the experience of the body. So how can we use this as a frame uh, to study garments? Well, um, the sensory archaeology of cloth as a subject has been developed in detail by a particularly influential scholar in textile research called uh, Susanna Harris from Glasgow University. She has published quite extensively on this question, uh, which is now flourishing through different projects. Um, in these different uh, papers, she has developed the sensory archaeology of textiles in which she exposes the two theoretical frameworks that have uh, prevailed so far. The first one is the technological approach to production. How was a cloth made? Um, it was and is 
still very much needed to set the basic knowledge of the material. Uh, we need a unified way to record fabric so we can compare different technological traits um, and understand production in a broader scale. All in all, this sort of like technological approach has produced and continues to produce a huge amount of data that we can use now to compare uh, and build more sort of interpretative um, studies. The problem in this uh, approach is that it frankly has a tendency to alienate a lot of the modern reader uh, because the technological descriptions are encoded in a very specific terminology that nobody really understands uh, beside a handful of textile researchers. So we suffer a little bit the syndrome of the textile nerd, uh, you could say. So we need to find a different way um, to talk uh, about this, this material. The other framework um, is the semiotic approach to dress, uh, which states that dress can be read and understood as a system of visual signs um, that can be related to identity. So, in broad, broadly speaking, we can, of course, use this. It's a valuable approach um, to understand elements of identity, such as gender, age, range, and so on. But it is often uh, quite difficult to use on the only basis of archaeological remains because they tend to be quite small fragments um, that are a little bit difficult to recognize um, as whole uh, garment. So in Anal Valley, we receive uh, quite a lot of help from the material itself, uh, frankly, because the arid climate has guaranteed the good preservation of complete or nearly complete garments. And we also have a large corpus of images, iconographic representation of people wearing different um, elements of dress. Uh, but still, when you look at a piece of garment, only to look at its meaning, like to gather information about what it could have meant um, about the person, you tend to focus very much on one cue only, and that would be your sense of sight, what you see. Um, so, Susanna Harris has kind of advocated for what she called a sensorial turn in the archaeological, in the archaeology of dress, uh, to incorporate a much broader um, understanding of garment in space and of garment on the, on the body. And in my opinion, I think it makes perfect sense, I said it before, uh, clothing is what is resting on your, on your body, it is in many ways laden with sensory receptors uh, right on your skin. Uh, so I think it works pretty well to explore different types of sensory perceptions and to try to better understand the experiences uh, of people. So uh, that is in a sense uh, how we can bridge the material remains. Uh, you have here on the um, left of the screen uh, textiles and on the left a small fragment of uh, leather from the meiotic symmetries of Psi. So bridging this material, the technological description of it with the sensory um, perception. So uh, Susanna has built a method to do just that, uh, that tries to go beyond this very rigid technological description that integrates all types of cloth and also uh, touch upon different types of experiences. And Usually, the whole sort of like system uh, rests on the principle that the properties of the finished cloth depends on the properties of its constituent parts. That means the fibers, the thread, and the weave, in the case of textiles. So I'll explain that now. Um, that has been modelized uh, before by a researcher called Linda Amerlun. When it comes to textiles, of course, the lever is to be documented in a different way, uh, into this pentagon shape. Each category is a category we record during textile analysis, and each has sensory consequences when one using the finished product on the body. So we document the type of yarn, the binding of the yarns together, the thread count, the weaving, and the finishing. So first of all, the yarn, the thread. Uh, it is determined by two factors, the type of raw material, so the type of fibers, and the way the fibers are twisted together to form a thread. So you have here different uh, microscopic view of cotton fibers um, here on the right and of a cotton yarn from the same textile uh, dated to the meritic period uh, from Psi. 
In that case, the thread is made of a single element that is spun in an anti-clockwise direction, which is noted with an S. It comes together eventually, <laughs> promise. Um, then you have the binding, uh, which refers to the way the threads are interlaced with each other, which are, of course, closely related to the type of loom and to the knowledge of the weaver. So here you have the example of a simple tabby weave, very one over, one under uh, structure, very basic, again from Sai, uh, which was most probably woven on this type there, of warp weighted loom. So each different types of weave would create a different type of surface, which has a different texture, so it feels differently on the skin and it behaves differently, especially in terms of strength, strength sorry, and flexibility. Another important aspect is the thread count. That is to say, the number of thread per centimeter square. That's very nerdy, that part, because then we can do all kinds of beautiful graphs. Uh, but basically, it's just encoding what we see in a textile. So the number of warps, that's the vertical threads, versus the number of wefts, that's the horizontal uh, threads. Depending on how many you are, you have, uh, in one centimeter square, as well as the thickness of each thread, the finished textile will be either very dense or very open. Uh, I guess it makes more sense when you're looking at the examples. Uh, these are two examples from actually Middle Kingdom textiles from um, the Helvari. Um, at the top, you can see um, sort of like medium to coarse um, weave. As you can see, the threads are much thicker than the example uh, at the bottom. They are closer to each other. There is no gap between them, so you end up with something that is much, much denser and much thicker versus the one at the bottom that has very thin threads, a lot more threads per centimeters, but it's, there is much more space behind it, um, between each thread, so it's, it's see-through, very flexible, um, very thin fabric. So naturally, these two textiles here, for example, will feel and they will move very differently once they are used on the body. The last category is everything we put under the word finishing, uh, everything that happens once you remove the textiles from the loom. Um, that can include all the steps taken to shape the final garment, such as cutting and sewing. Um, at the top, you have an example of a cotton loincloth from uh, Jebelada that was um, originally a sort of semicircular shape and it was sewn in shape with these rolled hems. Um, finishing can also include the use of applied decor, uh, such as embroidery, uh, for example. Here we are in, in Karanog, not too far, the same region uh, of Lower Nubia, with a uh, rather beautiful uh, blue embroidered pattern. Uh, in that case, it is, it's quite heavy because the, the threads are very, very uh, close to each other and there is a lot of uh, stitches. Uh, so it would have added a significant weight uh, to the garment, but it also adds, of course, color, um, making the motif kind of like stand out uh, from the other, um, from the, the surrounding uh, area of the garment, but also making the person wearing it stand out uh, from other people. So here, you could say that shape and decor play quite an important role uh, with visual as well as, as vestibular senses. Uh, that is to say on the way people can move with the garment and the way other people see them. So um, now to go a little bit deeper <laughs> in this uh, concept, I would like to spend a little bit of time to explore the different methods uh, that are used in textile research to uh, record relevant sensory information. As we are doing so, I will use archaeological example to build piece by piece the sensorium of meritic garments. So the first method, or I should say the first uh, layer of inquiry uh, that you can use is everything related to natural sciences um, as well as microscopic ima imagery. So going down to the raw material, mainly used uh, to identify the type of fiber uh, that uh, is present, but also, for example, dyes 
or even uh, like uh, biochemistry, organic biochemistry, um, to identify ancient proteins and things like that. Um, today, I will just show you examples of, of uh, microscopy, um, but all talking about the qualities of the different um, fibers that were used. So the first one that we meet uh, in ancient Sudan, as well as, of course, in Egypt, is the large family of bast fiber that is better known for its most um, relevant um, component, flax or linen. Uh, it is widely attested in Egypt and Sudan, um, of course. Uh, but we also have, starting from the first century BCE, uh, the arrival of cotton. And uh, we also have wool. So um, we have examples of flax as early as the A group, um, but it is not used very, very much. Well, we don't know yet too, too much, we are finding out. Uh, then a lot more cotton arrives, as I mentioned, at the turn of the first century BC. And then wool, um, well, wool is a whole different story. Uh, it was very sporadically used before because sheep didn't seem to have much soft wool. It has a lot of like shorter and coarser hair. Uh, but eventually, uh, it seems that there is a noticeable change in its properties uh, and the patterns of use towards the late Meritic uh, and post Meritic period, so fourth century CE, somewhere around this, uh, around this time period. So we have much more wool in the later period. The structure of each fiber um, give a certain like physical and chemical properties, um, and all of them greatly influence the way uh, the final product can be handled and also its aesthetic. So, just to give you an idea, sorry, or destroy everything. <laughs> So uh, to have a little bit of a stop on flux, uh, we know that it is a very strong fiber. It has good heat conductivity, which means that, uh, well, it keeps you cool, basically. It absorbs water, and it's very stable in shape. It's also yeah, strong and resists abrasion. It also resists insects, and it has a very slow degradation pattern uh, through sunlight which all of these together uh, form a um, textile that tend to be soft, cool, crisp, and quite smooth. Um, also, it can be a little bit like shiny, so what is called lustrous. And all of these qualities were definitely um, recognized and even sometimes enhanced uh, in ancient Egypt specifically. Uh, with, for example, the use of bleach uh, linen, but also the pleated dress. Because the fiber really is stable in shape, when you form the pleat, uh, it would actually stay. Um, so they really enhance the, the physical uh, characteristic of this fiber. As I mentioned, there is not too much flax uh, in, in Sudan, for different reasons, that's a little bit beyond the, this uh, talk. Um, and at the moment, we are very much building our data uh, for this early time bracket of the so to say, A group to Kerma period, uh, so Bronze Age. A little bit. So I don't have too much to show you just yet. On the other hand, um, a quite important um, sorry, fiber um, starting with the Meritic period is cotton, which really behaves very differently uh, than flax. It is much more elastic, it is much more absorbent. Um, it has a good heat conductivity still, so it doesn't keep you too, too warm. Um, but yeah, again, very elastic, and it is more dye absorbent. Um, it is, in a way, softer. Um, it follows the body more, it wrinkles more, um, well, differently. And it's, yeah, breathable and cool. Because it is, uh, it is absorbing dye slightly better, we start with the Meritic period to see the use of uh, quite a lot of, well, usually blue, blue dyes um, on these uh, cotton garments. And very often also they are uh, bearing a lot of fringes, tasseled fringes, like you can see here on this example. Uh, keep the fringes in mind because they'll come back a little bit later. 
So wool, again, is quite different. Uh, it is much better uh, heat insulator, so it keeps you warm. Uh, it absorbs shock, also very elastic. It has a very good stretch, uh, but it is not as strong uh, as the other two. Um, it is, on the other hand, extremely easy to dye, uh, and the dyes um, stay on the, the fibers a little bit more, which is called color fastness. So it is warm, very soft, or prickly, depending what you do <laughs> with it. And because it is a little bit more elastic, it drapes very well. And for that reason, for example, this is why uh, wool was very much used in ancient Rome or Greece for the togas, the mantles, all of these like, very large uh, wrapping uh, garments uh, that had many folds. And in Sudan, we see similar um, types of garments arriving at the same time, really, as wool become more popular uh, towards the end of the Meritic period. Here you have an example of very large uh, mantle with Hellenistic uh, figures in the, in the corners. And you can see, for example, all of these um, colors were uh, documented from one single um, fabric in, in Jebelada. So an explosion of color in this later period. Um, so we have just seen how uh, types of fiber can have a huge impact on the feel and the behavior of the cloth. But it is not the only player, uh, you could say. We also need to consider the role of the weave, the interlaced uh, structure of the cloth, um, which influences the density, the flexibility, the stretch and coverage uh, of the fabric. And to document this, we are going to zoom out a little bit uh, and use a macro analysis that is looking at the structure and technical characteristics of the fabric. That is really the bread and butter of textile research in many ways. And in order to show you a little bit what it looks like, I will use these two examples from the lower Nubian uh, site of Jebelada that are today stored at the Royal Ontario Museum in uh, Toronto. So both of them uh, were uh, probably used as a wrapped garment that would have covered the upper body in a manner of a mantle or sort of a cape. Uh, of which we have a uh, contemporary representation on both men and women um, yeah, wearing this type of cape in the context here of processions um, which are gathering members of the, the elite uh, during the Meritic time. So the first one uh, is made of cotton. It is a basket weave, meaning in the two system you have every time two threads uh, which creates a quite thick and very strong uh, textile. It also has piles. So pile is the little loops that you have on top of the fabric that resembles very much a, a towel that you could use in a bathroom today. And that adds quite a lot of warmth. Uh, so this piece is not, not very flexible, not very stretchy, uh, and quite heavy, um, you could say. It has a very high density, so it's covering uh, very thickly whatever part of the body it was uh, worn on. Um, it also has uh, specific technical points uh, along the, the edges. It has a twined, it's called lower edge, with these with cords you can see here on the top, uh, which much thicker threads. It also has large tassels that were attached to fringes along the lower border. And both of these elements would have added uh, quite a lot of weight in the lower part of the garment. Um, so here we can imagine that it would have influenced a lot the way the garment would have um, fell on the body and the way it would have moved uh, together with its uh, wearer. We are a little bit in a different ball game uh, when we look at the second example, this time made of wool. It is a similar type of uh, structure, but this time only one thread in each um, system and much thinner threads. So at the end, you end up with a fabric that is much thinner and not as strong as the previous one. It is much more flexible, much more stretchy. Uh, it has a lower density, there is much less threads uh, per centimeter, and it's also very uh, distended uh, in some areas, uh, with some areas that are quite uh, see through. It also has uh, reinforced salvages and a very flat, very flat surface. Uh, 
uh, with corded edges. Um, so here the focus would probably be way more on the draping, on the way the fabric would have a sort of like um, stand around uh, the body. I suppose it is a little bit of a good time to take a little excursus to uh, garments made of animal skin. We know, of course, that Nubians were wearing garments made of animal skin, of leather and of fur. Um, as yeah, many of them appear uh, represented uh, as such in the New Kingdom uh, tomb painting, specifically in, in Egypt. Uh, we see women, for example, dressed with these long paneled skirts uh, and men wearing long cloths made of spotted fur, apparently. And in our modern understanding uh, of leather, we tend to associate these garments with something that would have been very uncomfortable, uh, quite thick and unyielding, keeping the body quite warm. Uh, but actually, if we start looking um, at um, archaeological example and use leather analysis um, to be in a similar framework that I just showed you on, on textiles. Um, we realized that it was, it was definitely not the case. Um, example here, uh, the top one, you have a pan grave, uh, maybe a per, uh, yeah, personal container, a type of, of bag, uh, but it's the same type of technique that we found on several garments. The leather is very thin, it is degrained, so the, the, one of the surface of the skin has been removed. It has been colored as well, and there is very thin uh, stitches. The bottom uh, example, uh, it's a group from Lower Nubia as well. Uh, it is made of red leather that has been assembled with bicolor, like fur skin inserts, so it's a kind of like patchwork um, of skin and fur. Um, so both uh, examples, you can see, are heavily processed. Um, and in a way, um, I hope you can a little bit see or try to understand uh, that these garments would have been much lighter, much more flexible and soft to the touch, but uh, we would think uh, at first glance and definitely uh, very well suited to the climate. The part of the study that is about animal skin in the project is carried out by my colleague, uh, Lucy Skinner. So I thank her for sharing our documentation. Another method uh, that we can assess, that we can use to assess the sensory dimensions of, of garments um, is experimental archaeology. In this, we use modern reconstructions of cloth and garments, um, but we will then test uh, or use as a starting point uh, for conversation with different uh, test subjects to record their experiences uh, and relate the results to the archaeological findings. So this part of the project has not started yet uh, on the textile material, but the points I mentioned earlier, the feel of the fibers, the weave, the coverage, the weight, um, and the impact on wear and on movement would be really at the heart of our um, questioning there. So we will be working on recreating one of these long wraparound skirts, uh, which seem to have been made of a similar type of fabric that I showed you earlier, um, made of cotton. Quite heavy, uh, presumably, because that's the kind of uh, archaeological remains show us. Uh, iconography also shows that it could be finished by these um, quite well-attested uh, borders made of open work and very long fringes. Uh, but we have actually uh, reconstructed before. Um, so we will use, uh, we'll work with the same uh, weaver, Ulrika Moktad, uh, at the Center for Textile Research. We specialized in uh, archaeological reconstructions. Uh, we will also conduct a wearing tests to see how it sits on the body, how it moves, how does it feel, and so on. Um, we will also do reconstructions of different types of fabrics that I previously mentioned. I do not have anything to show you yet, uh, but I brought similar ones from uh, the center, but you can Some of these differences just when the type of weave and the type of fibers changes. Uh, on the other hand, my colleague Lucy has uh, already done quite a lot of experiments with skin. Uh, so you can get an idea of this very thin and stretchy lever. I'll just uh, show you that one, I suppose. 
other examples, other type of treatments applied to, to skin. Um, and this one has been degraded and degraded, sorry, and sweated, uh, which is a bacterial um, um, step in a, in a chaîne opératoire. Uh, and you can see how soft and stretchy. All right. Another type of sources that can be used um, are modern accounts, ethnographical records, and or contemporary practices. This is actually quite difficult in Sudan uh, because there is a huge chronological and cultural gap uh, between past and present uh, realities. And also, a lot of the ethnolog ethnological accounts uh, were made during the Anglo-Egyptian uh, condominium in Sudan. So there is clearly an important colonial filter uh, that we need to question. I will show you in the next slides two photographs that were taken during that time uh, that give an example of a very specific type of garment. But please be aware that they show young girls partially nude uh, whose images were acquired in a context of empire. So the garment of interest here is the string skirt. Uh, we know of it in recent times under the appellation Rahat, which is a leather skirt, string skirt, that were worn by unmarried girls in Nubia and further south as well. So interestingly, uh, we know of several archaeological examples of string skirts. Uh, one on the right is um, from the late Meritic site of Gamay. In Nubia as well, it is made of leather and plant fibers, as well as uh, shells and metal beads. And we also know of several uh, string skirts from Kerma, so this time um, jumping back in time in, in a Bronze Age. Um, and in Kerma, they were made of this very thin strip of uh, leather that were assembled on a cord in between beads made of uh, ostrich eggshell. Um, of course, in the present state of the documentation, um, it is very difficult uh, to say who was wearing these garments, this type of garments, uh, because we are jumping across such a vast uh, period of time. Um, but it is, I think, quite interesting um, to ask questions about this type of garment, the string skirts, um, the fringes, the long fringes would have hide um, part of the body, but only partially. And because they move very easily with every movement of the wearer, uh, they alternate between hiding and revealing. Um, and of course, when such a skirt is worn by itself, it amplifies the movement of the, the person, especially in dance, as uh, you have an example here on the, on the left. Um, and also leaves large part uh, of the body exposed to view. Fringes are also a very present aspect of Meritic textiles, actually, um, where they very frequently adorn the lower border of the cloth, um, either like in simple fringes or in like very um, heavy uh, row of uh, tasseled uh, fringes, usually coming after this band of open work border. Um, so they would have certainly had a considerable weight um, at the bottom uh, edge of the, the garment and accompany, again, the movement of the, the wearer. And as far as iconography can tell, fringes are present on both male and female clothing, as well as in a royal costume, uh, where they form these very typical crossbody sashes that you see here on the Queen Amanitore in a, in a lion temple at Naga. Uh, on this particular relief, it's quite interesting to see that the arm is actually passing through uh, the fringes, which can also wrap uh, part of the body, for example, here the knees, on this uh, shorter skirt, um, on the, the woman represented in this um, bowl from, from Karanog. Um, so the fringes are not at all a static element of dress. On the contrary, they are in constant movement then change the shape of the garment as it moves, uh, and it affects what is shown or hidden uh, of the body. And this is where I suppose I will close this talk on the sensory dimensions of clothing in ancient Sudan. The different methods we touched upon have raised different types of questions relating to different senses. 
Um, and if we come back to the representation of this, of this meritic woman from Karanog, we can wonder, for example, how she looked like, um, what about her silhouette, the shape, the size, the color palette of her dress body. We can also see, uh, starting to wonder, how did the garment feel on her body and around the body? Did it produce any sound as she moved uh, in it? How was the garment, fast, the garment fastened around the body? So what kind of action, did gesture did you need to do to make it uh, hold on the body? And how did it move when she moved? Looking at this uh, theme around movement, uh, we can also uh, start to imagine how the garment influenced our movement. Uh, did she feel very free to jog for 50 meters? <laughs> or would, she, would it sort of like refrain parts of a movement. And finally, looking in more like introspective um, way, we can ask if the garment kept her warm or cool. Uh, could she feel the weight uh, of this skirt? Um, yeah. And how did she feel and dealt with um, this kind of very sharp opposition between the upper body that is left uh, nude and the lower body that is, on the contrary, wrapped in a very heavy piece. So many of these questions can only be tentatively answered uh, with hypotheses, certainly not free from what we feel as modern researchers. Uh, and in a way, uh, we find here uh, the core, core, I guess, of sensory archaeology in that it is kind of like incited, um, pushing us yeah, um, to not shy from our imagination as archaeologists to kind of like embrace it uh, in order to bridge this gap between uh, the material and the past thoughts or feelings. Um, it is in a way a limitation of this paradigm. How can we know that our reconstruction of past experiences were true? Um, yeah. In Sudan, we can also, um, we don't have uh, written sources that could shed light on the sort of like belief system of this particular person, uh, for example. But in any case, such sources are rarely or ever um, unfiltered truth anyway. Um, so here, I suppose the tenets of sensory archaeology give us kind of a free pass, uh, not to dwell into the sort of impasse that is objective truth, um, but to embrace this part of our work as a sort of an evocation, as a narrative with multiple storylines. So by following them today, I hope um, that I managed to show uh, how we can use garments as a mean to come a tiny bit closer uh, to past people and to better understand their daily experiences. Thank you very much, and I will be open for all of your questions. If you have any questions or yeah. No, I talked way too much. One hour I was given. I think I'm almost on the on the dot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just I would like to say that uh, this uh, study is very useful for the, uh, the archaeologists and post for the local people uh, to, to, to make the, um, uh, some item of uh, some archaeologist item very live. I think the local people, they need to know what uh, the um, system of product, uh, productive, uh, the, the textile uh, from the beginning of the life up to now. And also, uh, if you don't mind, to, I would like to mention for, uh, 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 I think, garment you mentioned here, I think with the candies. Yeah. Yes. This one? Yeah. Yes, this, this mm -hmm. one. 
This is uh, for the ethnographical uh, study. This is still, they use it for the bridegroom in Sudan. Uh, I think they, they use it uh, after the ancient time. They use it for two centuries before for the bridegroom when she's dance, dancing. Until yeah. now they use it, but um, and it's very sensitive, not like this. But this is for the, the um, yani, I, I would like to mention that this is used up to now as ethnographical uh, yeah, the uh, heart, IT. Like yeah, the like Yeah, thank you again. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for, for your comments. Um, and it called, uh, is my name? Rahat. Rahat, yeah. Um, well, thank you for, for your comment. The point on using this as dissemination, I absolutely that was my wish from the beginning to produce reconstructions that we can use to talk with people as a conversation starter almost, you, you could say, uh, because it's always easier to relate with this type of material when you can touch it uh, yourself. Um, so we'll be working on it uh, and I really hope that we can kind of like build a sort of um, event at one point where we can interact with, with people. I would have liked, of course, to do it in, in Sudan. So let's see how, how we can uh, work this out in the future. I, that's really, really my, my hope. Also because, to be honest, sometimes, I mean, these, I, I picked nice pictures of nice textiles, but very often they look terrible, you know? <laughs> Tiny little pieces of very black and sometimes smelly things. Uh, so it's very difficult to actually extrapolate, you know, imagine what it could have been uh, feeling like on, on the body. So that's very much what I was, yeah, trying to play along with, uh, with this uh, theme. And, yeah, the Rahat is a, a, a big... Uh, Question. It's very difficult for us to use. Um, we know it's there. Uh, Julie Anderson from the, the BM has published a very uh, useful paper uh, on that. It's difficult to use because of the time difference, and it is so specific, linked also, as you mentioned, to the, um, to the, the wedding ceremony, the czar, and, and, and all these things. Uh, but it's difficult to know what it could have been, you know, in meritic times and even before. Uh, but it is very, it's very interesting to see that there is this very long continuum uh, of the use of fringes um, in, in Sudan. A lot of things that dangles <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Elsa, there's a question online. Mohamed Suleiman from uh, New York. Um, he, uh, is there any evidence of a large workshop for textile production. I wonder how textile technology developed in, sorry, in, in Nubia over time. Thank you, Mohammed, for your question. Hi, uh, thank you for coming all the way from, for listening from New York. Um, so there is no workshop per se attested in Sudan. So no single um, architectural structure with a concentration of textile tools. Um, as far as I can see so far, tools tend to be spread out across the entire settlement um, with a noticeable maybe concentration of tools uh, in areas of, in a courtyard, for example, in houses. So in sites such as Tila Island, where you have these sort of like compound uh, houses with big uh, courtyard, Usually you find quite a lot of textile tools around these areas, probably because you need light to weave, uh, of course. So in these sort of like areas that were semi-covered maybe, so we can imagine a sort of little pergola <laughs> structure over the loom. Uh, but otherwise the spindle worlds, so the kind of little weight that you put on a spindle to spin fibers, they, are, they turn up everywhere. They kind of like, yeah, in the streets, in refuse deposits in kitchen uh, context, a little bit everywhere. So it seems to have been a very widespread uh, activity in daily, uh, daily life, but no specific workshop uh, per se. I have a lot of questions about the um, control of production, especially for the cotton sort of elite production of the Meritic time, because that tends to show a sort of involvement of the authorities, let's say. But so far, no workshop. 
Yeah, I wish. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Elsa. Um, thank you for your presentation. I've got several questions, but I will only ask you two. Okay. What about fevers from birds? Do you have any mention of from wh from where? Sorry. The fevers from birds. Birds, yeah. So yeah, fevers. Fever, yeah. fevers, yeah. And um, what about the? Do you have any idea about the colors selected for the for the garments and the entire cloth? And by colors, you mean the actual raw material used to produce color, the dye? No, no. Les, les plantes what, tinctorielles? What were the colors of the, of the garment? The original ones. Yeah. Uh, so about feathers, um, so far, we don't have much evidence for the use of feathers together with dress. I can tell you that I have one little tassel made of feather, blue ones from Jebelada, but it stands alone, so I don't know what it was part of. And there is one mention in a rather old publication about a feathered cloak, I believe from a C group uh, site. Yeah. But we can't find the actual remains of this object, so I don't know. Still looking for it. <laughs> yeah, so we don't know. It might have been there, but so far it's, it's not showing up. Of course, we have a lot of ostrich feathers used as personal, um, say, um, yeah, artifact in the fans in the Kerma period, for example. And we have representation also of some people, some maybe a different uh, ethnic group that had a feather uh, on the head. So far, I, no smoking gun of an actual feather no. on someone. <laughs> the, on the rock, rock art, when mm, we yeah. have uh, archer bowmans from yeah. the fourth millennium, usually they have penny shift yeah. and they have feather yeah. on the headdress. Yeah. yeah, and we are trying to like gather evidence of headdress. Maybe we would find, uh, you know, the, the way that the feather could be standing on the head. And there are several headdress. Uh, that we know from archaeological uh, sites of the C group and Kerma period. Um, but yeah, very beginning so far of uh, amassing data on this, and there is not that much to start with. So it's a big question, the feather. And the colors. Um, so in a case of cotton, what you see, well, these are examples from Cassie Brim. Some of them have been washed uh, in the past, so I cannot tell you the original color. Uh, a lot of textiles because they come from um, from graves. They tend to be this like golden brown shade. When you look closely on the, the microscope, you can see that it was probably very very pale beige white. Uh, so natural color of cotton and blue. Uh, with the Meritic time, especially with cotton garments, we have a lot of blue. It's the main main color. Um, that they chose at the time, uh, so indigo coming from wood probably uh, at this time. Then when we have wool, it's much like a, a lot uh, more colors, still blue tend to be the choice. A um, little bit more red, a bit more purple uh, in later period as well, uh, but not the same type of um, color choices that you'll see, um, I, I suppose, in, in Egypt in this so-called like Byzantine period. Yeah. Elsa, another question online from Olga from Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, could you please comment a little bit about the swastika at your last ah. slide vest? Yes, every time I show this, <laughs> uh, this uh, image. Yeah, so we actually have it on iconography as well as on textile. Here, I don't know if it's very visible, it's a um, um, figure, um, it's a frieze actually, of Vastica uh, signs uh, in tapestry. Uh, it's actually quite widely present in Meritic uh, iconography. It's part of a um, iconographic repertoire that comes uh, from Hellenistic uh, Egypt, I suppose. On textile, it shows up at the same moment as well, I suppose, yeah, these at the top, um, well, here it's fragmented, but it forms an angle or sometimes just a bar. We call them gamma figures. That's something that we also see in, um, 
in, uh, for example, represented in Greek or Roman uh, Fayum portraits and, and, and so on in, in Egypt. So at the same time, the Svastika um, appear. Um, so it's part of the same sort of um, iconographic repertoire. Uh, probably also conveying this idea of renewal, of rebirth, uh, in a sort of like Hellenistic vocabulary. Uh, but usually the Meritic tapestry, it's very often patterns related to rebirth, either with like very Kushite iconography, with lotuses, offering tables, and all these things, or more Hellenistic um, yeah, signs such as the swastika. Yeah. Okay, online, no question. Okay. In the room, Should I think. Know. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Elsa. and to everybody online as well. It was a pleasure to, to hear you. Thanks. And you have lots of greetings from Boston, from uh, Washington, Germany. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And Sudan came in.